What, yeah, chess, so what, what ball team do you play for then? If you're for me, yeah. ballet, I was uh, in a bit heavy in a ballet. Yeah. No, I was, wait, I was waiting for the, the, bar. yeah. Pure bar, right? pure bar guy. <laughs> now come out the main stage. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. While this podcast will always be free, the time and effort that goes into the production isn't. Show your support and join our Patreon community today. Hey everyone, welcome back to episode 183 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm your host, Kenny Coleman, and there's really not a whole lot of news to talk about. However, there is one common theme that we start seeing to kind of blanket across the bourbon industry, and that's prices. Prices are going up. It doesn't matter. It's happening across the board. And to note some things that are happening, you got Four Roses. They have announced that their private barrel selections are going to see an increase. So from the days that you used to see $65 barrel selections at your local store, expect that to start hitting $85, maybe even $100 in the upcoming few weeks because that effect happened on January 1st of 2019. Buffalo Trace has also announced that they are increasing prices on their Old Weller Antique line. It is having a new MSRP of $49.99. However, the weird thing that we kind of found out is that the other suggested retail price of Weller 12 is actually only at $45. So I don't know how they get to that math, but interesting to find that out as well. Now, Boone County is one that kind of came out of nowhere, I'd say somewhere at the beginning of last year, maybe the year before then, of just having really solid single barrel selections of good age stock of MGP juice. And now we're seeing yet another price increase from them. I remember the days when you can get it for $75. Uh, it had moved to $100. And we have to give a shout out to Christopher of Houston Bourbon Society, who kind of led us down this path and gave us this information is that Boone County, their new single barrel releases are moving to a hundred and seventy five dollars MSRP. So it got to the point where Houston Bourbon Society, they actually picked out a barrel of Boone County, found out what the MSRP was going to be and then passed on it. So you're not, who knows? That's a crazy story. You might see more of that happening here in the future as you see more distilleries start upping prices beyond what was going to be an expected route. Now, we're talking about a lot of stuff of raising prices everywhere. However, here at Bourbon Pursuit, we're actually not raising prices. We are actually giving away bourbon. That's a, that's right. That's what we did this week for our Patreon community for our another celebration of another year for Patreon uh for our December giveaways, we actually did three bottles of bourbon. Uh, one was a single barrel pick of a 1792 bottled and bond that happened from the wine rack here in town. Uh, another one was a Buffalo Trace that was a collaboration between the wine rack and Harvest Restaurant here in Louisville as well. And then the third was a bottle of just good old Eagle Rare. So happy to be able to bring those types of giveaways to our Patreon community as well. Now, today's episode is really like a perfect marriage and a harmony that we had with our last episode of 182 when we talked about barrel sourcing with the Brindiamo Group. Now, sure, there might be stock where you can have the ability to make a $15 million purchase today, but where do you get those funds? Uh, you know, is a traditional bank the way to go? Would they even understand the business model? And you probably are going to get risk getting denied from the bank. Or... Do you go with someone like our guest today who knows how to put collaterals on a barrel of whiskey and gives you return on dollars that can help fund your brand development? It's an interesting show that gives you yet another aspect into how you build brands and how you raise money from venture capitalists to be able to build new bourbon brands. Now, when you do listen to this, make sure you understand that we record our podcast pretty far in advance. For We do it for scheduling purpose to make sure that uh, we get everything kind of done in a, a non-hectic way. So you're going to hear some interesting tidbits about Fred sleuthing that actually held true about Corsair closing their Bowling Green distillery, as well as talking about Dave Pickerel before his passing. Now, if you haven't had a chance yet, make sure you go to bourbonpursuit.com and you sign up for our mailing list. That's the way you get all the show notes with all the links mailed to you 7 a.m. every Thursday, and I should say 7 a.m. Eastern every Thursday when these podcasts go live. With that, enjoy this week's episode. You're going to have a quick message from Joe at Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick 
with Above the Char. Hi, this is Joe from Barrel Bourbon. Coming this fall to our Barrel Craft Spirits line is a 25-year-old American whiskey finished in Circeo Madeira casks. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Bourbon is our beloved spirit. We cherish it, study it, taste it, talk about it, and even gossip about things that don't matter to the normal people. Bourbon is our beloved hobby. But we must not forget that we cannot sip irresponsibly. With every drink, we must know the situation. How much have I had? Am I okay to drive? What is my limit? If you don't know your limit, there are apps that can actually help you, and the U.S. Dietary Guidelines can be found at health.gov, which highly recommends moderate drinking, which is one drink per day for women and up to two drinks per day for men. If I'm sounding preachy, or at least out of the ordinary, well, here's why. This past week, a family of five was killed by a drunken driver in Lexington. The Abbas family was driving back to Michigan from Kentucky when an intoxicated man drove on the wrong side of I-75 and crashed into their van, killing all passengers, including seven-year-old Giselle Abbas. Giselle will never graduate high school, fall in love, have children, or realize her dreams because somebody who abused alcohol chose to get behind the wheel. So when you hear about bourbon companies speaking drinking responsibly, this is why. We've lost too many wonderful souls to those who ignore responsible consumption. And if you think these incidents do not have an impact on the bourbon culture, think again. In addition to breaking our hearts that we lost the Abbas family, drunken driving incidents hurt our ability to grow the bourbon culture, the fun, the people, the lifestyle. Anytime the Kentucky legislature pursues a bourbon-positive bill or the federal government mulls improving alcohol laws, naysayers will rightfully point toward these awful tragedies. We must do everything in our power to prevent death by alcohol. Not because it's what's best for bourbon, but because it's what's decent and the right thing to do. And here's the thing. The next time, it could be one of us who loses a loved one to a drunken driver. I love bourbon but I love my family more. So please drink responsibly and don't drink and drive. And that's this week's Above the Char. Make sure you're subscribing to my magazine, Bourbon Plus. It's available in newsstands nationwide. Also, visit bourbonplus.com for a subscription. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. The whole team is gathered here today in downtown Louisville to discuss a, a fun topic. So, of course, Kenny, Ryan, and Fred Minnick coming at you. First this, time ever on site, all three of us. Awesome. Yeah, coming together. It's Interviewing fun. someone. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> with with a person. With a person. But like a human being. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> someone felt bad enough for us to talk to us. So You, you always remember your first, right? That's right. <laughs> well, it is. we should point out we're in a basement, so it's, you know, we're not we're not on the high rise so he put us in the basement it's well, a finished basement well yeah <laughs> just saying it has a tv <laughs> so we'll it's get true. there but and i also we'll get to introduce our guest but today's topic is going to be really interesting especially for uh those brands that are out there that are looking to grow or people that have an idea that they've found their grandpappy's mash recipe and they want to open up a distiller and they want to figure out well how do i get capital for all this so we're going to talk about how to raise money which in today's world, uh, you know, I, I look at it easier one way. I mean, Fred, Ryan, correct me wrong. Do you think it's hard to raise money in today's market for, for starting a bourbon company? <laughs> well, I think it's all about the players involved. You know, if you ha- have a, a thoroughbred at the helm and you've got a lot of you know strong supporting cast, no, yeah. I don't think it's going to be hard to raise money. But if you're like a lot of these people who kind of start from nowhere, no one knows about you. You're gonna get a lot of no's. Kind of like Kenny and us, like when we start. No one, no one gave us the time of the day. So hey, I would <laughs> like to point out, and I try to do this all the time. I was the first person to actually believe in you guys, and I asked you to come record the Kentucky Derby Museum series. And what happened when I did that? He we, didn't. We messed up the record button. <laughs> so, so maybe I have a bad judge of character. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You can't be at VC. Yeah, that's funny. But we'll go ahead and we'll introduce our guest. So today we have Chuck Morton. Chuck is a venture capitalist.
Lewis with the Bourbon Bank Fund that is backed by Venture First here in Louisville, Kentucky. So Chuck, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. And it's unbelievable. The first time the three of you have been in a room together like this. I know. Don't you feel honest? It's incredible. Wow. The last time all four of us were in a room together, we were drinking bourbon for a good cause at the Speed Art Museum. Absolutely. Amen to that. So, Chuck, I want you to give an opportunity to, for our listeners and people that are viewing out there. What is Venture First? What is the Capital Bourbon Bank Fund? Or the, sorry, the Bourbon Bank Fund. What, what are all these things that, that you're ultimately doing here? Sure, I'll give you the, the uh, elevator pitch answer to that. The Venture First is uh, 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 started about eight years ago by John Shoemate, um, Wharton grad, local guy from Louisville, Kentucky area. Uh, shout out to John, wherever you're at. Um, Venture First is a full CFO services company, valuation, equity, uh, M&A company. Uh, based in downtown Louisville, we have offices in Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, Miami, Florida, uh, and soon to be in Cincinnati. So we're, we're growing. The, to answer your second question, the Bourbon Bank Fund, this uh, started out several months ago as a, <clears throat> an instrument to assist those small and mid-sized distillers that as you suggested, are struggling to, you know, to grow due to lack of, of funding. And you know, standard institutional lenders are, are going to struggle to be able to loan against a liquid asset, whereas we relish that opportunity. Mm-hmm. We understand the value of a, a liquid, to paraphrase the old liquid gold um, conversation, we actually believe in that. And so you know, we look at uh, uh, barrels of bourbon, rye, and we analyze it, we take a look at it, we learn everything we can about it, we have it chemically tested, we, we then talk with various brokers in this space to find out you know, market values. Uh, then we put a loan to value to that bourbon and uh, we're happy to loan against it as that being the collateral, no personal guarantees. We do do cursory financial uh, review and you know, background checks. But uh, we're here to help the distillers grow and give them an opportunity. You you know, it's funny, like you you talked about that. So I know a lot of people, Kenny, who are trying to get money and all that. And uh, they'll come to me sometimes for advice. Like, you know, where where should I go? And I've I've recommended, you know, Chuck's group in the past several times. And people quickly say, no, 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 we don't. We don't want to go to them. I was like, why? It's like. They do too much background checking. <laughs> My credit's not all that great. So, so I take it, Chuck, you don't like losing money. Well, it's really not. To, you know, the, 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 top, the top thing on our whiteboard over there is not, hey, let's lose some cash. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we, like we didn't to, get in this basement about yeah. being broke. You know? <laughs> well, you know, to that point, you know, the, the, the funds are, are not brought from in-house at Venture First and the Bourbon Bank Fund. We literally have, have taken it out to market to a lot of local investors who got us started with individual SPV funding with projects. And uh, as of today, we, we are very close to nailing down $100 million in funding for the Bourbon Fund. So it will be a true fund that we can pull from for those that you know pass the sniff test on our end. You said it's, SPV. What does that mean? Yeah. Just give us, you know, it, lay people... Sure. An SPV would just be a, a, uh, a single uh, deal, so a single um, uh, LLC, if you will, that we fund. If someone says, yep, all right, we've got a million dollars worth of bourbon, we'll do a 75% loan to value, and we'll loan you $750,000. The collateral is the juice, uh, and uh, you know, we'll find investors to back that. Those investors will take X percentage based on what the credit looks like, what the juice is. You know, if it's a, if it's a 12-year Kentucky bourbon, it's, it's pretty valuable. And we know if, uh, if someone defaults, we're not going to get harmed, nor will our investors. And so, you know, investors get paid quarterly. Um, we make it easy for uh, our clients by saying, listen, guys, it's a four-year note. Um, first 24 months, interest only. And, you know, we give them a chance to grow. We're not here to, to make it hard for them. We truly want to make it easy and allow them to grow. And, and we're not in this to, to make a bazillion dollars, but we're not here to lose money either. So what's your, oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to give him a proposition. He's got this incredible, you know, <clears throat> fund going for bourbon. Guys, why don't we ask him just straight up right now, like we need $90 million <laughs> just, but with, with like no return on investment. We have four barrels of bourbon. <laughs> and, uh, That's cool. Like and you, 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 you see sure this, it's not rum? <laughs> like, yeah. You see this equipment here, you know, we're, 
We're in need of some help. So I got an F-150 what do you think? Bucks. 90 million is what it I'll takes. I'll tell you what would yeah. be a good step in the right direction is if I could get one of those Bourbon Pursuit podcast hats to cover up this lack of hair. <laughs> that would be a really good start, guys. Hey, we'll even throw in a t-shirt yeah. or a koozie. <laughs> now you're, you're getting warmer. Get, get warmer. Get more so so well, tell, tell me who your ideal customer is in, in the bourbon game. So, you know, you got <clears> anywhere from a startup to the big companies, but where is your niche, I guess? Sure. Why don't, why don't I give you a couple examples of clients that we previously worked with without naming names? Obviously, we can't do that. We, we privacy is very important. No, oh, you can't. You can't uh, say who you've worked with. Um, not without getting uh, primary permission first. We, we we can talk about one of our clients here in just a moment that we're doing okay. some other things for. But yeah. you know, I will tell you. I, I'll give you an example. There's a uh, uh, a company that is outside of the state that that we've loaned money to. Um, they've created some pretty good juice. They've got some some product that they purchased, and they're laying down some of their own new fill. They've been very successful in the vodka gin space, and they're distributing in about 16, 17 states. And so we take a look at where they've been and where they're going. We like the people. And at the end of the day, guys, this comes down to whether we like that client. Mm -hmm. If we don't like them, we're going to price them out of the market. We're just not going to work with them. We have an OA-hole policy here, <laughs> and, and we, we strictly adhere to that. And, and so you know, that's an example. We gave them a, 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 a pretty fair interest rate, no personal guarantees. Um, they, they've got a, a really good storage facility, um, you know, because that's another important factor here is making sure that the bourbon we collateralize is stored and insured mm -hmm. properly at current market values, not replacement value. Uh, these are all things that come into play and, and things that need to be well thought out. We have another, another uh, very large client that's in all 50 states. Um, they're, they really weren't in, in need of a lot of capital, but they realized the smart move is if we have $10 million in in juice that's sitting in a warehouse, why not borrow against that and put that to work? And we'll add another, you know, we'll add a bottling facility. We'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put it into, you know, acquiring more barrels or, or whatever it may be. So it's essentially like a HELOC or something for a homeowner. Like I got this kind of, not really, but I have this home who I have, I have equity in and I want to do an addition, you know, so I go and borrow against my house. I, I think that's a pretty good analogy. I mean, if you've got someone that's got a, you know, a, a 24 inch column still, and they want to up, up production and, and, and boost it or maybe put a doubler or maybe they want to add another column still in their 24 inch. This is a good way to acquire that funding without having to go out to institutional lenders or giving up equity. Cost of equity is, you know, 30 percent higher. You know, we're, we're talking, you know, uh, typically anywhere from, you know, 12 uh, percent to 18 percent, depending upon the, the credit worthiness of these individuals. But again, there's no personal guarantee. And it's a lot less expensive than the cost of capital. Mm -hmm. So that's you kind of just led me into the next thing I was going to ask is, you know, why would why would these people come to you versus going to, say, like a traditional bank to get some sort of loan? Fair question. Um, I will state this, letting you know that I had a breakfast meeting with a very large bank this morning that had a client that they wanted us to work with. Uh, very difficult for you know a standard institutional banking facility to to, to loan money against a liquid asset, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially an alcoholic they based find it's asset. It's too risky for them. And you might as well just go loan against cannabis when it becomes legal here. <laughs> now it will be by the when time we, it's when, when we say liquid asset, you're meaning the literally the 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 bourbon or the literal you literally. Don't, you don't liquid. mean like liquid assets like we correct refer, okay. literally liquid. Yeah. Go. So I mean, I guess kind of expand on that a little bit because you know when we think about. What do people do? Because you, you, you just said that you had started a few months ago kind of getting into this and we'll probably be in a year or two pretty soon. But what were people doing before this uh, when they're thinking about how they're going to expand it? Do they just have to go through traditional routes and, and does what you're doing make it more attractive to them? Sure. I, I, I think that uh, the, the general uh, way to approach it in the past was, you know, the, the family, fools and friends. Mm -hmm. would be your first approach, Family, <laughs> fools and friends. you know, the, the, the three F's. And yeah. if that doesn't get you where you need to go, you, you find a, you know, a local, what we'll call an angel investor uh, that would be willing to put up, you know, X amount, but they're also going to take a, a decent equity spot in your company. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, you're going to get diluted. And, you know, your dream that you've been chasing, by the time you get to reality, you may not even be the majority shareholder anymore. And it becomes not quite so fun when you're not calling the shots in the company that you envisioned five years earlier. And, and so we, we want to help people avoid that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you all do not take any equity in the firm. It's just an interest. Oh, we'll take loan. as much equity as somebody wants to give. <laughs> right. But, but, and, and I'm not going to say no in some cases. Yeah, that could be, you know, it could be part of the, the deal with, with a Berman Bank fund. Maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe they say, all right, listen, we'll work a deal for a couple of points. And, and if you can do this for us, or maybe, maybe, maybe some of our folks internally invest in it. 
And that's possible too, and and has happened with some of our current clients. How are customers really approaching this? I mean, do they do they find this a lot more attractive than than going that traditional route to a bank? I mean, do they are you starting to get those phone calls first now, and they say, Chuck, we've got X. What do you think? I think it would be great is if you called every single one of our potential <laughs> customers and asked them that question. That would be great. But yeah, I, I think it's um, you know we're we're fielding a lot of calls and a lot of emails, people exploring the options. And most folks don't realize this is an option. And so, you know, once they're exposed to it and you compare it against, you know, the standard, you know, FFFs that I mentioned and angel investors or institutional lending, I mean, yeah, a, a standard bank will loan money to you if you, you know, put your house up and, and your building. We're not asking for that. We're simply collateralizing the juice. And let's, you know, maybe th- th- it's going to be a while before they can afford to lay down their own juice, but they can go acquire you know, maybe 100, 200 barrels, blend their own. We all know how that happens. Uh, and we can help them acquire that to get them started. It's a good launching point. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take a scenario that somebody, we'll say like Peerless. Um, so Peerless here in town, they they built their their facility. They said that they're never going to source. They want to create everything and sell everything of everything that they did. Are you looking to find people like that where you can help them on the ground up from just <clears throat> basically making, uh, you know, from just craft whiskey at the very beginning and not actually having any sort of juice as collateral except maybe their name behind it? The answer is yes. And uh, when you talk about, you know, what Corky and have done at Peerless, it's absolutely incredible. And, you know, it, uh, Fred made mention earlier, it's really who's at the helm. And if you've got, you know, th- the right name behind you, um, that changes the complexion of the game entirely. Uh, for instance, you know, we're working with Jim Rutledge right now and in, in all aspects of his business and helping him with the jw rutledge distillery brand and couldn't be more excited uh it's a little bit different type of animal but to answer your question in short yes we would look at any type of deal so you'd go from anything from a startup to to any i was just this from an investor side the startup of a bourbon just seems like crazy to me like all right guys it's going to take four to six years you know before we can start turning and then Maybe will people will like it and they'll start liking it. So how do you approach that from your side? Sure. And as you might guess, we've had a lot of folks knock on the door, uh, and we've had to turn away a, a few folks that, that come in. And, and would you say a, that's the majority? You turn away the majority? No, actually, I would I would call it more like twenty five percent. We turn away and seventy five percent we help. Even if we don't end up working with them to to gain capital, mm-hmm. we still offer some very sound financial advice. Uh, and some pitfalls to avoid, and people to go talk to in the industry, mm-hmm. and and that's invaluable. You know, there's a lot of folks come in. They have a, you know, my great grandpappy's pappy had, uh, uh, you know, had distillery mm-hmm. way back when, and we want to build one just like it. What do you think? I, th- I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, what's your brand identity going to look like? Who's your master distiller? What you know? What's your plan? What's your five year model? And uh, we can help them with all of that. And you know, it, it's going to come down to the, the individuals. It's going to come down to you know what wherewithal they have to put you know skin in the game to a mm-hmm. certain extent and and uh, you know if they've got something earth shattering we're never going to say no because you never know what might come through the door yeah and uh, what the next big it might be so what Chuck are, uh, go ahead bud. well I was just going to say what are some common mistakes that you notice with distilleries getting started or making that <clears> jump <throat> from the one level to the next well I think the number one is giving up too much equity. Um, and I'm saying this and, and knowing that, you know, I've uh, been an equity investor in a few deals myself, but, uh, and I just think that, you know, uh, people might have a, a somewhat of a level of ignorance on the way that the process could work for them. And instead of, you know, saying, okay, I, I'm going to give the friends fools and family, and then I've got this guy that's worth $10 million. He wants to put a million in for 40% of the company. And, you know, before you're even started, you, yeah. you're owning less than 50% of your own company. That would be a pretty big pitfall. Mm-hmm. We would try to steer people away from that. Go slow. You know, we've got someone we're helping raise. Uh, well, we're not raising anything for them. We're helping advise them on uh, on on how to acquire about three four hundred thousand dollars to get them to the next level on a product that they've started. Uh, they've got it laid down right now, and and the early signs are they've got something pretty good. And, you know, we want to help them get to the next level and avoid some of those pitfalls. You know, giving up equity is a big one. Um, uh, uh, getting in bed with the wrong investor is a big one. Uh, and, and again, you know, sometimes they're going to go out and maybe uh, uh, buy some bourbon from XYZ. Uh, pretty important you know what you're buying, 
who you're buying it from, where it came from, what it looks like, you know, all of that stuff. So very cool. So another thing that you kind of talked about there and, and helping more and more and more people get into this, at what, do you think there's going to be a point where the market might just be too saturated with distilleries and, and, or is there still like, there's plenty of room in the pie for everybody and the pie keeps growing. Sure. And, and I'm certain Fred can, can lend uh, more historicals on the number of distilleries that were here many, many years ago. And it's well over what, 250 or something back before pre-prohibition. Oh, as far. Yeah. We were in the thousands in the, in the early 1900s. And how many do we have in Kentucky right now? 40, 50? Yeah. 40, we're, we're, you're, we're, remember, you're the expert. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's funny. It's, on what it, day it is. It, it's actually sure funny. It's authority. like we actually just lost a distiller. Um, I, I haven't broke this yet, uh, but, but Corsair is probably going to be ceasing operations in, in Bowling Green. So they're moving, we're making most of their they, – they've decided to, like, shift things completely over to Tennessee but so that's like one um there's been a couple of them that have closed like um the moon the moonshine centric one so like the number in the last month kind of I think dipped but it may have went back up with a couple other ones and but long term there's still there's 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 room but there's so much shitty product coming out (laughs) of a lot of them and I think that's where you got your challenge, and this is something that a, a, um, a venture capitalist told me is like they would rather put money into a, a source whiskey brand than a craft distiller. And if you look at the buyouts, that's what the trends have been. Angel's Envy, from what I'm told from local investors, was the, the best deal since sliced bread for, for local money. High West, which was public, you know, $160 million. Kentucky Owl, which sold 127 cases in its lifetime and sold for millions. You know, so all three of those were, you know, sourced whiskeys. So you make a valid point. <clears throat> in, in our opinion, um, we believe that this is a, a very long runway. And we've done a lot of internal analysis of, uh, and, of course, looking at all of the, you know, external data that's out there and we believe this is you know anywhere from an eight to 15 year runway in in the bourbon space and um while while we know there's always going to be some drop off and and i have some more information to talk about (laughs) uh you mentioned corsair and bowling green we'll talk offline on a few things that i heard today myself um (laughs) you heard that today too. interesting yeah and and a few other things um but there's uh you know I think that there's plenty of room for you know these craft distillers. I think you'll see some perhaps maybe you know uh, um, merge and get bought up, um, you know different types of, of formations. But in our opinion, there's plenty of room, uh, and there's a lot of unique ideas and concepts out there. You know, there's a lot of there, there, I know of at least two new cooperages that are uh, um, one under construction and one that's coming. Um, we know them quite well, actually, and you know that that that's a pretty good sign when you've got you know someone's going to throw out another two hundred thousand barrels a year um, into the marketplace. That's a pretty good sign that that folks um, are are bullish. What uh, what data are you looking at that is giving you that runway? Like what you know is like telling you, okay, we do have you know eight to fifteen years. Sure. Well, we've looked at it from a global perspective, and, and I and I think that's that's really where you know there's a major impact and. You know, we love the fact that the state of Kentucky has just, you know, really taken a strong grasp and embraced what we're doing. What, what you know, what people, like what you're doing, what these distillers, I mean, it's becoming an iconic American brand. Uh, the Chinese market in, persp- uh, in, uh, in particular, very big. You talk about the Australian market, the Western Europe market. I mean, they're, they're clamoring for craft. And what I mean by craft is, uh, you know, not a Jack Daniels. Does it say young <laughs> underage whiskey? There's, there's people screaming for that. You know, what what is the the numbers? I think around what 30, 30 to thirty six percent of new uh, bourbon drinkers are female, due to you know the cocktailing craze. And we believe this is a long term trend. People are building habits that are going to carry along, you know, generationally. And um, we we feel pretty strongly about that. To answer your question on the date, I mean. It, you know, if you, these guys can't see, but if you look behind you, we have uh, uh, several uh, unbelievably talented analysts down here at Venture First that have spent a lot of time researching the marketplace from all angles. And uh, we, are they on Drudge Report every day, just looking at <laughs> and more? Yeah, <laughs> and more. Yeah, just like what checking stocks of MGP, like seeing how MGP stock doing today. Like, is is that with the? I, I like, would say that's probably on someone's ticker over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, give us some ideas of like what what kind of 
analytics are they really digging into uh, to be able to kind of get some of this information knowledge out? Sure. So, you know, when you start looking at, um, you know, at, at uh, uh, you know, let's talk about the oak itself, by the way, and where that comes from. I think it's a great starting point. Yeah. Start I mean, with the damn know, trees the, themselves. The, <laughs> you know, the stave business, which is, you know, people are quite bullish on that right now. And we, we are as well. Um, you know, we, we can even get into the, the fact that there's a, a big uh, a need for barrel storage. Um, we've we've approached that as well with the company Bourbon Structures that we work with, and um, you know when you when you look at um, I don't want to give away all of our secrets by the way. <laughs> yeah. We want your but, secrets all. <laughs> yeah, but we're getting funding out listen, of this. Listen, nobody our nobody listens. Come on, it's all good. It's just it's just you said it, talking. not me. <laughs> yeah, it's it, listen. It's uh, it, it's a compilation of of projections based on analytical trends from a national, state, global level. You know, compiled together, and and uh, you know, we spend a lot of time feet on the street talking with the distillers and talking with the brokers and, and talking uh, with distribution and 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 folks like the you know the Paul Vargas of the world and, and where they're headed and 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 what the yeah. industry is looking like and you know all signs are positive. Um, I, I think globally, the last report we saw from last quarter, the fastest growing um, segment of spirits was actually uh, Irish whiskey. Bourbon number two, scotch, and then rum. Uh, I believe I got those in the right order, but uh, we yeah. track that on a monthly basis. I mean, if we see a, if we see a, an odd trend that would even signify a glut, you'll see a lot of things change. <laughs> and and you know, it's not like we would uh, pull the pull the the carpet out from under mm-hmm. everything. But keep in mind, the deals that we do on the financing are three to four year notes, mm-hmm. so we're still mitigating some risk. So. I told you, we probably should have done this at the very beginning, but how did this idea even come about? Did you know that according to adage.com, podcasts are able to engage listeners in a way traditional media can't? Podcasts are mobile. They can be taken anywhere a listener goes. It also becomes part of their daily routine, such as commuting, exercising, mowing grass, or perhaps just cleaning around the house. Did you also notice that you're listening to this right now? You'll never hear about a person just flipping through podcasts so your message is heard loud and clear. It's also a permanent endorsement because it's built into the audio playback. That's a benefit not offered by any other medium. If that sounds interesting, let's talk. Send me an email, team at bourbonpursuit.com. Now, let's get back to the show. So, I told you, we probably should have done this at the very beginning, but... How did this idea even come about? Like, what was the idea? And, you know, kind of your venture, did you did you get hooked onto bourbon and you said, there might be a need for this in the market, you know, because you're coming from this background. Talk about, like, how this is going to come together. Sure. So I'm not going to take the credit for this, but I'm, uh, John Shoemate, who's the founder of, of uh, Venture First, it's truly his baby. And, and frankly, you mentioned uh, Peerless. And I believe John and, and Corky had some initial conversations uh, with the concepts and you know, we, we just sat down as a group, um, John, myself, uh, Stu Nyberg down our Miami office, who's an absolute uh, magical finance guy. And, and, and Stu and I are kind of a tag team out there. I like to set him up, he knocks him down. And uh, we just came up with a plan that made sense for the marketplace, you know, from a supportive measure that also was cost effective on our end. You know, because it's, it's a fine line to, to bring investors into a deal uh, and, 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 and kind of put all these pieces in place so that everyone feels good about the deal. And that's really what we've done. And we feel pretty good about it. So you're not losing money yet. We're not losing money. Yet. <laughs> there you go. That's... And we hope nobody does. <laughs> and no one of your questions is going to be, hey, you know, do you see a bunch of defaults on the horizon? Do you see a bunch of defaults on the horizon? <laughs> Thanks. Great question. Thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, no, we certainly do not. Um, that being said, we, you know, we've mitigated the risk for our investors and that's, that's, Part of the reason why we do the due diligence, it's, it's to protect us and our investors, but it's also to protect the, the distillery client. I mean, you don't want to put anyone in a bad situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just don't want to see them fail. And that would just be bad for the industry. It would be, it would be bad for everyone. Hmm. Well, but I guess the, the good thing of a default is that then you get like 300 barrels of bourbon <laughs> to figure out what to do with, right? So there's, there, is a, there is a silver lining in this after We'd all. We'd have a hell of a party. <laughs> yeah, that's At true. someone else's expense, which would be very bad. <laughs> yeah. We don't want that. No, we don't. 
I guess not. But then you've lost 25% right off the bat, you know, off your well, investment. <laughs> well, so actually we wouldn't have lost anything. The, dis- the, the distiller would have lost because, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a loan to value. Right? Okay. So if we loan it at 75%, let's say it's a million dollars, it's a $750,000 loan. It's a year later and they've defaulted. Well, okay, they've made some payments, um, they've defaulted, and, and now we own the bourbon at 25% less than what it's worth. Mm-hmm. Or, wow. or 25% more, right. realistically. So, so it's a no backwards. lose situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know, um, Let's I know you're so highly. Can, I want to get into this. I know. How do we get in? <laughs> Bring a $100 million to the table, boys. Exactly. Well, how much will $1,000 give me? <laughs> <laughs> He's actually thinking about it. <laughs> I might get you a seat at the table. All right. Small table. Yeah. <laughs> Over in the corner. So I know you're highly regulated by the SEC. Are you allowed to uh, work with people outside of Kentucky or are you limited to Kentucky? Great question. And yes, we, we can work with people outside uh, Kentucky, outside the United States. Um, uh, one of our first clients, well, our, our first two clients were actually outside the state of Kentucky, ironically. Um, wow. It's actually sad. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, same thing here. So <laughs> as I, you know, in, in studying, you know, distilling history, you know, you're seeing the return of Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, but you're also seeing states that never had, you know, really prominent distilling histories come with a vengeance, sure. like Wyoming, for example. Utah actually did have a distilling history. Brigham Young was a, was a distiller, by the way. Really? Yeah, the, the high priests of the Mormon church were actually all whiskey salesmen in, huh. the, in, the, in the early days. That's how they made a lot of their money. Because they didn't drink any of their product? Well, they also helped start Las Vegas, so they're, they're all about uh, peddling the sin, just not consuming it. <laughs> At any rate, you know, do you, when, you're, when you are evaluating a, a, a distillery, how much does the name Kentucky come into it? Versus like another state. T- tough question to answer. I mean, again, it comes. It really comes down to the people and, and, the, and the names involved. You know, obviously, as you well know, a Kentucky bourbon carries more value and a little bit more steam in the marketplace. It should, right? It absolutely you know? should. Yeah. Being an East Kentucky boy, I'm all about that. Mm-hmm. And you know, so when we look at something we're in a finance, if it's if it's bourbon being laid down in Kentucky. We're going to feel there's a little bit less risk, of course, because uh, uh, inherently it's it's worth more at the end of the day. Uh, by the way, back to your question earlier, I hate to derail, but we, we also have a partner that we work with called Aparity. Aparity is a, a data analytics company. They're based here in Louisville. I'm giving a little shout out. John Madeline over there. Um, they work with the, the beams of the world, the, the Patrons and others, and we acquire a lot of industry data through that partnership with Aparity. Is any of it public? Can it a lot public? of it's public, yeah. 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 I would I would suggest you reach out and talk to John Madeline at a parody, actually. <laughs> yeah. I I love data. Yeah, it's always fun to kind of dive in and figure out how people are getting to the the idea of being able to do this because yeah, you have to have something that supports it at the end of the day and the data never lies. Data's king. Mm-hmm. Right. So do you have like a like a bullshit meter? Because what we see in whiskey It's I going mean, off right now, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine you, there are so many people trying to get capital, and you, they come to you like, "Oh, my grandpappy founded this whiskey in 1822, and he's brought the yeast fourth back. cousins of the yeah, I mean, it just, <laughs> there's just so much BS. And then when it hits the market, like the consumer base just goes nuts and saying, calling them out. So I mean, there's got to be, you got to have a high level BS meter for these people. I think we, well, yeah, we do. And, you know, we take them through the paces. I mean, you know, it's an initial, you know, bullshit meter test when we sit down for the first time. And you can usually kind of tell. To get through that, we we then look at financials. And if they come in with one piece of paper with crayon, probably not so good. (laughs) You know, if they've got a five-year plan and and they've got a modeling done, okay, they probably cut the mustard, get to the next level. Then we talk about, you know, who's your master distiller? Oh, we haven't thought of that yet. (laughs) Oh, Okay. Bit of a wow, problem. people really do that. That has happened, yes. Wow. What's been the poorest pitch you've heard? Without And don't name names, but I just want to hear Uh-oh. what that was like. Mm. And they're probably listening to this, so I don't know who they are. <laughs> but I wouldn't say it's the poorest pitch. It's just one of those the most very, 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 very passionate group. And, uh, you know, they look like they were very prepared, look like a solid plan, except, uh, you know, the, instead of building the brand first and getting a product out, it was, hey, let's build this massive place. And people come visit it, and it's in the middle of nowhere. 
not not the most solid plan. We highly we highly suggest their field of dreams kind of kind yeah. Of plan. Which you know, and, and it really it was it was uh, it was very robust. The problem is, you know, I hadn't thought of a master distiller yet. Don't have that. I'm like, okay, let's take a big step back. <laughs> let's and pump the brakes. Yeah, let let's let's go ahead and, and start a small brand and let let's get a little following going and let's get it in front of the Fred Minix of the world and let them you know take a look at it and say, okay, you guys are on the right track. Here's a pretty little mash bill. We like what you're doing. And let's start there, you know, mm-hmm. and learn the business before you go spend millions of dollars on a facility. And so coming along with this, this bullshit meter, there's no master distiller. I want to kind of take a scenario because let's take somebody like Dave Pickerel, who is the mass, quote unquote master distiller of a thousand distilleries <laughs> out there, right? He's legit though. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you, you take that, but sure he comes in, probably does something for a little bit and then maybe he's out and he's never actually really there seeing any kind of day-to-day operations yeah. when you hear somebody that's um hiring Dave Pickroll to do this or hiring one of the many names that are out there that could possibly do this I mean is is that a turn on or turn off for you well I think it's a little bit of both I mean it's great that they're finding you know uh, a solid uh, mentor and you like to think that they're bringing someone in to, you know to to teach them the right way and you've got the right pupil there that's willing to learn, that, that has the intellect and understanding and the willingness to put in the time and effort that it's going to take. And, and in that case, that's, that's wonderful. Now, if it's just, hey, we're going to have Dave come in and create this wonderful mash for us, and, and that'd be great, and now we're on our way. Let's just go do it ourselves. Eh, that, that's not so smart in our opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that you kind of have to look at their, their long-term strategy of what they are going to be doing with this. Absolutely. You had mentioned the the, the, the the distillery that needed some work. They were they kind of had like a tourist bent. Uh, with all the growth in tourism, you know, I, I've heard a lot of distillers say that's not our lead. That's kind of like a complimentary income. Is that what you're looking for? Are you looking for people who are valuing the whiskey first versus the experience? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, <clears throat> again, maybe it's the Eastern Kentucky background, background but it's what are you making? What are you putting in that barrel? And, mm-hmm. and, and if, you know, if it's swill, we don't want any part of it. If your focus is on making the best juice you can, you're going to do well. And I mean, people come to you no matter what. Yeah, because I, I think you're totally right. I don't know if you can bank money on opening the next six flags at a, at a distillery, <laughs> right? And thinking people will just come for that. True. Uh, unless you're stolen, you might be able to pull that off. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see how big their Ferris wheel is. Yeah. <laughs> and now, the other thing that you had kind of mentioned earlier is that there is a growing need for more cooperages, more rack houses, more rack house builders. Kind of talk about where <clears throat> your investments lie within some of that or, or the people that you're talking to or, um, you know, what's the, what's the plan of, of having those as part of the portfolio? Sure. So we are in conversation with uh, uh, a couple different cooperages to, you know, help them expand, start up. Um, we will advise them on, uh, you know, CFO strategies, you know, uh, valuation um, and, uh, and how to properly go about raising the equity the right way. And uh, in various capacities, we can advise them of that. On the Rickhouse side, I mean, you, you, it, it's, it's possible you might see <clears throat> the bourbon fund own its own Rickhouse here in a very short <laughs> period of time, and, and we'll store some of that bourbon that we're financing. It only makes sense if we're storing it for an investor. And let's say we've got a group in New York that's got $20 million into the bourbon. They, they might want to flip on their, their computer and go, oh, there's a surveillance camera in that Rickhouse that we have. That's nice. Hey, guys, check it out. And, you know, it has a bit of a coolness factor there. Not to Why is Kenny you. Coleman going back there and tapping into our barrels? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm secretly planting microchips. Why to figure is, out why is his go. nickname Bung? That's weird. <laughs> so what is it? So going into an industry like Rick House Building, you have one giant that leads that with music. So what's, sure. what's the thought behind that? Like, you think there's more space that we can outcompete them, outsmart them? How do you think that you can compete against them? I'm just curious. <laughs> no, it's a great question. And yeah, they've done a, they've done a bang up job for a long time. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the word on the street with, you know, with our partners at Bourbon Structures, which, you know, has a, a quite a compilation of uh, experience with Luckett and Farley designing the houses and, and a major construction company and uh, U.S. Framing, the largest commercial wood framing company in America involved, um, you know, not to mention, and, and we can provide funding for it. Um, you know, we, we think that there is an opportunity for sure. Uh, I mean, you guys know as well as anybody, there's a big shortage of, of proper storage facilities. And... Um, 
you know, I know Bourbon Structures is looking at using, you know, different shearing type elements. And, and I've seen dozens of designs that are outside the typical, you know, rectangular box, you know, tasting rooms inside and, and just some amazing stuff. Uh, a little bit more ergonomic. And, and I think the most important factor is that, you know, they can get started now. Uh, and, and I, from what I hear, uh, music has got a pretty big backlog, and, mm-hmm. and no offense to them, they have a great company. So, right, yeah. sure. Well, there's plenty of room for growth in all this, I think. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think we're going to probably come to a close here uh, relatively soon, unless there's some more questions that anybody kind of has in their back of the mind that they want to uh, pick his brain about. About you know, you know, we already yeah, t- we I already want- tried to get ninety million. What if we? We'll start at ten. Can we start at ten? I still want a hat. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Two million good. dollar hat right here. Yeah, brother. yeah. Got it. <laughs> With Fred's hair. And yeah. All. It's ten and a half. Ten and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of want to run down some of the deals that have happened in in the past few years, just to get an idea of like um, what what the people earn because a lot of our audience you know we we see a number from like high west selling selling for 160 million dollars how much money is actually going into like mr perkins pocket at that time give us give us a give us like (laughs) depends on what who's his or let's say let's say (laughs) angels envy or whoever talk about like you know what kind of return is is coming to the owner or the investor because we just see the number yeah. We don't know what the actual return is. I, I think uh, uh, that's going to be predicated predominantly on, you know, what's the structure of that company? How many investors do they have? You know, if, if it's one of the local companies we've worked for in the past, there may be, you know, 1,500 investors that are involved <laughs> in that, and everyone's taking a piece. Um, <clears throat> frankly, it's all the more reason why people want to avoid giving up equity and, and using the liquid asset you mm-hmm. have to borrow against because, you know, if someone comes comes to you three years from now and and offers you a hundred million dollars for your company and you only own three percent of it, that's that's a little bit disconcerting. Yeah. Now you know if you've done a great job and you own eighty percent of it, good on you. <laughs> I mean that's fantastic. You know throw a party and I hope we're invited. Um, you know, but it, it's really predicated on the deal, Fred. On yeah, you know, and how, how much debt they had to start. Yeah, there's there's and, so yeah. many different. You know, they're they're. I think it's a fine line. I don't think I know it's a fine line between debt and equity to, to, to really operate a distillery at, at, at the, the, the highest level of operation. Debt, is, debt can be your friend. Is there, you know, from a consumer perspective, are there some, are there some telltale signs that, that we can see that a distillery is about to sell or, mm. you know, that they're thinking about that move? Well, I guess if someone goes and buys a fancy car, maybe <laughs> <laughs> buys that that, that new F one hundred and fifty with everything on it. I bring I bring this up like when I got a tip when uh, Beans when Centauri had acquired Beam eight months before that. I got a tip from someone that there might be something happening because a certain consultant had been uh, disclosed to wow. the SEC. So I was wondering, like, from a smaller from a smaller perspective, uh, is there a way that consumers, you, you know, like just human nature, like what do people start letting go of staff? Do they, you know, cut expenses so they have more profit? What, what's something that people typically do when they're trying to sell? This will be treading on some of that gray area that I'm not <laughs> sure I really want to dig too far into. Okay. But, um, you know, we, we stay away from most uh, most. Uh, because you know bourbon, rumors that affect fact basically b- what bourbon is right now is we have we're it's like the sports world you know we would uh, and th- consider this like a sports talk show like we love talking about potential things yeah. happening and so there's a there's the word on the street there's a conspiracy theories and that's really what this is about and so i guess at the end of the day you know we just want to know when someone's going to sell before we just want to know the signs <laughs> because we want to. We want to buy our stock. You want to buy, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you want to buy up every bottle yeah, that's, we got before the price goes up. Yeah, so we'll, I got. I got oh, go ahead. We'll talk offline. <laughs> so I got a question for just in venture capitalists in general, or is an investor? Say I'm an investor in a distillery. You know, you like so there's fifteen hundred. Are you receiving like dividends throughout this, or are you just waiting till the end till it's acquired by someone, or how is that kind of structured? So if you're an investor, usually for sure, an investor, yeah. So if you're an investor, an equity investor, you know, in a specific deal, you know, distillery X Y Z. It, you know, it depends on whether you're a preferred investor, A round, B round, whether you're a, a, a friend's family full early investor, the way it's structured, maybe there's quarterly dividends, maybe there's no dividend and, and there's never, um, you know, a, a liquidity event 
for the investor until there's a sale. Maybe you're getting an, you know, an annual uh, dividend based on the profitability. All mm-hmm. of those things, uh, it, it's all predicated on the deal and the way that the initial structure is in place in the operating agreements. Would you, prefer, would you prefer a business or a distillery that has, say, it's turning a good profit, it's churning, keeping cash flow running good, or would you prefer something that's going to, your end goal is to be acquired? Like, we're just spending money, spending money to build it. We really don't care about profits. We just want to make it as big as possible to get acquired. What's... You know, kind of the we'll take option A 100% of the time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we would much prefer someone that is, is doing it the right way. They're they're churning, and, and just you know creating a profit and building that bottom line. That at the end of the day, they're the winners. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think this has been a, a pretty awesome discussion. Yeah. Yeah. About looking at the the ends of, you know, if you're either starting up or if you own a distillery and you you need finance, you need capital, and you don't want to go to a traditional bank, you don't want to give up equity. This is a new route to go. It's a pretty interesting way to get. Yeah, you know, one question we didn't ask is how much do you need to start a distillery? Wow, that's a that's good, good question. Um, very good question. And I think that's, uh, again, there's going to be a lot of variables there. I mean, are you, you know, are, are you educated in how to create your own mash and do it yourself through maybe contract distilling and you go to one of the, you know, uh, one of the one of the new distilleries that's coming up that has actually capacity open. So <laughs> five million? Don't. Five million? Yeah, it's a pretty good number. <laughs> okay. Pretty good number. Uh, so five, it's, it's, it's five like a, million is what I have enough what family, friends, and foes with millions. <laughs> yeah. together, five million. No, I'm kidding. You got a buried in holes. I think you could do it glass for less. Jars. I mean, you could do it for less. If you're going out and you, you know, you're, you're, you're contract distilling, yeah. you know, and, and you're taking your time and you could do it for less. I don't know why anybody would want to open distillery. I would just be going, calling up MGP or <laughs> Barton or whatever. Hey. <laughs> Well, you it's got over contract. there. <laughs> Pro- problem is their their capacity is you know I think you could probably call Daniel Lind over Barstown Bourbon and say yeah we'll talk to you in ten years. I mean you know they're they're killing it. It's fantastic I and mean, yeah. it's, it's a wonderful wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it is it is a tough market to start a distillery right now and to make your name and then yeah you've got to do exactly what you said. You've got to either contract out excess capacity. You can sell barrels. You got to figure out how to make that margin. So. Definitely some thought for the future there. But, you know, Chuck, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. This was uh, very enlightening, I think, for mm-hmm. all of us. to My to pleasure. To yeah, more about it. Yeah. I, I feel honored and emboldened to be amongst <laughs> the three of you at one table at the same time. <laughs> you should and be. I still want to have <laughs> <laughs> We'll get you that. So if people want to know more about Bourbon Bank Fund, uh, you, how do they get in contact with you? Sure. Uh, you can uh, contact me at chuck at venturefirst.com. Uh, you can call our main number off our website. Uh, you can call Fred at home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a good thing to, uh, and yeah, like, for per, per my SEC regulations, I am not affiliated with Venture First. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> once you give up that, once you give up that, you have an interest. Once you give that hat up, you, you know you're. It's yeah, is, your is, deal. It, is that a, is that my deals? So is it giving them the? Uh, it I want you, it gets you entry into visibility. 20, I want twenty percent equity. Ooh. of your company for this hat wow <laughs> it's a deal that's on a your deal. side that's a bargain that's a bargain so again chuck i want to say thank you again make sure you follow our visit chuck's website go check it out at venture first and you can learn more about the bourbon bank fund and of course if, if you have any questions about that make sure you reach out because i'm sure that he can he can answer a lot of it and he's going to lead you in the right direction if if you're a good fit or a bad fit that's just how it's going to work yeah um, but make sure you also follow bourbon pursuit on facebook twitter and instagram and if you like what you hear you want to hear awesome stories like chuck's and everybody else's give us a shout out on uh, on our reviews for itunes and everything like that because that's what helps grow the show is when you leave these reviews and uh, other bourbon nerds can find us too yep and we always love hearing from our listeners like with feedback guest suggestions show notes or not show notes we create the we show create notes. the show notes show suggestions so uh <laughs> Just keep them coming because we're doing this for you all. So appreciate y'all following us and listening. And Fred, your turn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, go check out bourbonpursuit.com. And with that, we'll see everybody next week. Cheers. 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 Thanks, guys.